Hi, and welcome to Improving Child Welfare Outcomes Through Family Engagement, Using Customer Service Concepts to Recruit and Develop Resource Families. I'm Jill Marshall May, Director of the National Resource Center for Diligent Recruitment at Adopt US Kids. I'm super excited to be able to offer this webinar to the field because I believe that how we engage and team with our foster adoptive and kinship families can greatly improve outcomes for children in foster care. As we all know, Satisfied foster adoptive and kinship families recruit other families. The more families we can retain and subsequently recruit creates placement stability for children and youth. Let's start with a possible definition of customer service. Customers' perceptions of the way they are treated, the responsiveness of the services provided, and the extent to which they are engaged in teamwork to meet the needs of children and youth. Your agency may want to create your own definition. The uniqueness of foster families is that they are both a recipient of services and a provider of services, meaning that they are both an internal and external customer, which increases the need for support, engagement, and teaming of our families. In our work across the country, we have seen how customer service affects the entire child welfare system, from CPS workers and child case carrying workers foster and adoption workers, and the Child Welfare Administration. We hope that the information provided in this webinar will be the beginning of a look into your jurisdiction's policies and practice with foster, adoptive, and kinship families. On today's webinar, we have three presenters who will walk us through their work implementing customer service concepts. First, Maureen Heffernan, consultant for the National Resource Center for Diligent Recruitment at Adopt Jewish Kids. Becky Main, Tribal Specialist for the National Resource Center at Diligent Recruitment at Adopt Jewish Kids, and Angie Williams, Director of Permanency at the Mississippi Department of Human Services. Before we dive into our presentations, we want to go over a few housekeeping de details for this webinar. This webinar is one and a half hours long with time at the end for us to respond to your questions. We will record this webinar and archive the audio and PowerPoint presentation on our website at nrcdr.org. For this webinar, we have muted your lines, but we do want to hear from you, and we hope that this webinar will be interactive and responsive to your questions. We will ask poll questions during the webinar and ask for your responses. On the next slide, we'll show you how you can use the chat feature to ask us questions. At the end of the webinar, we will have a brief evaluation form. Please stay on to complete the evaluation questions so that we can use your feedback to inform future webinars. Although your lines are muted during this webinar, we do have ways for you to submit questions or let us know if you need help. As you can see in the screenshot, you can use the raise hand feature to let us know if you need any assistance. You can also use the chat feature to submit questions throughout the webinar. We will collect the questions you submit, and we will answer as many of them as possible at the end of the webinar. You can also use the chat feature to let us know if you have any te technical difficulties. Our support team will respond to you to help you get any difficulties resolved. Let's briefly review the agenda for our webinar and then get started on the presentation. Today we will have an overview of key concepts, how customer service impacts child welfare systems, putting customer service into practice in tribal communities, developing and implementing a customer service curriculum in Mississippi, resources for strengthening customer service, and lastly, as we said, a question and answer period. Now we'll hear from Maureen Heffernan who will provide an overview of some key concepts for understanding how customer service affects child welfare systems. Maureen? Thanks, Jill, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be here with you today. As Jill mentioned, I'm going to provide an overview of key concepts and discussion of how customer service affects child welfare systems. In this segment of the webinar, we will be discussing how concepts related to customer service can be used to strengthen engagement and support of kin, foster, and adoptive families from the time of their first contact with the agency through licensing, approval, or certification, and on into the time they are caring for children and youth in their homes. This 
probably is a good place to pause and acknowledge that the term customer applied to the field of child welfare may be off-putting or not seem to fit well. It is certainly true that child welfare work is different and much more complex and meaningful than what we might see as the traditional business of selling products or services. Foster adoptive and kinship families, birth families, and child welfare staff don't usually think of themselves as customers. Still, we've found that what is sometimes called good customer service is a key element in developing trusting professional relationships and partnerships between families and an agency and in sustaining those relationships over time. A family's perception of how they are treated during their interactions with an agency and its staff members can have a major impact on their decision to become a foster adoptive or kinship parent and subsequently on their decision to continue in that role. Our focus today is on sharing some concepts, examples, and resources related to what we call customer service. We'll also explore the benefits of utilizing a customer service approach to child welfare work, including how this approach can help with recruiting and developing families as well as supporting staff. We hope that you'll find the concepts behind the ideas that are sure to be useful and that you'll feel free to find terminology that works for you to be able to apply some of these ideas in your agency. And since we're talking about terminology, I'd like to note that from this point forward, I'll often use the term resource parents as a shorthand way of saying kin, foster, and adoptive family. As we move along, we're going to spend some time on each of the concepts you see listed on this slide. To start off our discussion of the need to engage and support resource parents, We'd like to start with a poll and check in with you about the degree to which you're having degree, <laughs> the degree to which having enough foster families is or is not a need for your agency. If you work for a child placing agency, will you please take a moment to respond to this poll question by indicating which response is most accurate for your agency regarding uh, having a pool of foster parents that can meet the needs of your children in care. Um, please go ahead and respond. Is it not an issue, sometimes a challenge, consistently a struggle, or a crisis? Ooh, we're getting lots of responses. Um, where did the two people go who said it wasn't an issue? <laughs> All right, let's see. I think we can go ahead and close the poll because it really looks like uh, the majority of folks are saying that it's a struggle, more than half. It's really consistently a struggle. We really thank you for your responses. It really does look like many of the agencies or systems who are on the line today are experiencing difficulty in maintaining an adequate pool of foster parents for their kids and their teens who need care. That there are, you know, maybe a few places where it's only sometimes a challenge, but no one at all says it's not an issue. And so for some of you, a quarter of the people, it's really a crisis. So um, I think we're on target knowing that this is a real need. As Jill mentioned earlier, our current resource families are the key to having a sufficient pool of families. I think I'm on a different slide. I'm going to keep going. Um, as Phil mentioned earlier, our current resource families are key to having a sufficient pool of families who meet the needs of children in foster care. When they stay in service, they are a resource for the children in our community. They can be our best recruiters of new homes, or they can counteract our recruitment efforts when they tell their friends and families that they are leaving service. As this quote explains, because they are frustrated and exhausted, weary from navigating foster care system that feels to them to be difficult in us. Just how often is the relationship with the agency the reason that foster parents leave? It's hard to say. Data on the reasons that foster parents leave service is hard to come by for several reasons. One of the reasons is that this data just tracks very well. One national study discussed in a 2005 government report found that agency-related reasons are cited as reasons for sitting by 37% of former foster parents 
and by 62% of current caregivers who intended to stop foster parenting. We could probably have a lively discussion about whether these percentages are relevant today or accurate for your agency. And we can probably all agree that losing even one family because they do not feel they are treated well by their agency is one family too many, as we already struggle to find appropriate placement options for children. On the flip side, we know that when resource parents are well engaged, when they feel valued and respected, they can be outstanding supports not only for children, but for caseworkers, birth families, and other members of the child welfare team. Sometimes we ask specific resource parents to serve on a panel or a speakers bureau to support our efforts to recruit new families and build community support. And that is a valuable and tested strategy. At the same time, it's helpful to keep in mind that all of our resource families are already talking about us through their family and friends, whether we are asking them to do so or not. And the message is either positive or negative, depending on how they view their relationship with their agency. This quote from a foster parent captures the opportunity that exists in strong working partnerships between caregiving families and child welfare staff. If workers treated us with respect and kindness, we would do anything for them. Thinking back to my days as a child welfare caseworker, I know that statement to be true. As a young worker, I learned a lot about how to do my job from my agency's seasoned and generous foster parents, and they helped me to do my job in ways that were both big and small. So now, let's move on to another poll question. Does your agency or organizational leadership talk about customer service concepts or approaches for conducting your work? Let us know. Wow. This is looking great. It looks like for, you know, about half the agencies, um, leadership is talking about these concepts frequently. And um, for another third, sometimes. So that's really good to hear. I think we can go ahead and close this now, um, kind of trending. But um, I think we're really gratified to see that this is a topic that's um, on the mind of leaders and ag agencies around the country because it's so important that customer service is emphasized by leadership and then integrated into the agency culture. We know that there is a great need for resource families who can meet the needs of children in care. Because customer service is a crucial strategy for ensuring that recruitment efforts are effective in actually building and sustaining a pool of families, providing high quality customer service really does become everybody's business. The biggest impact of all, of course, is on the children themselves. Due to a lack of appropriate placement options, they may be separated from their siblings, placed far away from their family and home community, or simply not have the chance to live in a family setting, being placed in group care not because their needs require it, but simply because a shelter or group home is the only placement option available to them. Customer service is also the business of children's caseworkers who have trouble finding families who can really meet the needs of the children and youth who require care. And as we explored in the last poll, customer service is the business of child welfare leaders who see how the lack of sufficient numbers of resource families can impact key measures and outcomes including placement stability, well-being, and timely permanency. And of course, for those of us who work in recruitment and foster care, the need for resource families is an everyday concern. Another way to think about customer service being everybody's business is to think about the ways in which everyone connected with the child welfare agency can be considered a customer in one sense or another. When asking child welfare staff members who is the customer in child welfare, they typically answer the child. That's accurate in the sense that the primary focus for child welfare is achieving safety, permanency, and well-being for children. But we've come to believe that child welfare agencies actually have multiple customers. In the context of child welfare work, there are two categories of customers. First, we'll discuss those that we might consider external customers, or the people listed on this side with whom, with, on this slide and others with whom child welfare staff interact and who are not agency staff. 
These are the people that staff serve, collaborate with, and with whom they share their expertise. We also consider prospective kin, foster, and adoptive applicants to be external customers during the initial stages of their contact with the agency. Internal customers are the people you work with within the Child Welfare Agency. As you can see, they are colleagues, staff members in other agency divisions, and other peers who provide services to you or to whom you provide services. But more simply, every staff member within the agency, from the custodian to the highest level administrator, is an internal customer. When we think about the idea of internal and external customers, resource parents have a unique place in the discussion because they have characteristics of both internal and external customers, sometimes simultaneously, depending on the phase of their relationship with the agency and the dynamics of each caregiving situation. When they are in the very early stages of potentially becoming a caregiving family, they are an external customer to be sought out and treasured. Once they begin caring for children, as Jill mentioned earlier, there are times when they receive services and support similar to other external customers. Yet, at the very same time, they are typically providing valuable services to children and the children's families, making them an essential member of the child and family service team, along with other internal customers, even though resource parents are generally not employees. Our model of customer service emphasizes that internal customers make possible the agency's ability to provide services to external customers and promote positive perceptions of the agency in the community. Agencies that are interested in providing good customer service or good engagement and support for children and families find that they need to create an organizational culture that supports good customer services for both their internal and their external customers. Let's get a sense of your experience with providing customer service to internal and external customers with another poll. So please let us know if you think it's easier to provide good customer service to internal customers or to external. Hmm. This is really interesting. They were tracking pretty close, and now external seems to be leading the way. Look a little more. I think we can. I think we can go ahead and close this. It looks like um, both are important, but. Um, we may have to be a little more intentional about making sure that we have uh, strategies to address the needs of our internal customers, and we may do a little bit, it may come a little bit easier with our external customers. So um, that, in fact, is something that I think we see in a lot of places. We found that an organizational culture that promotes and supports good customer service can drive improved outcomes for children through multiple tasks. If staff members see and experience customer service principles modeled by their leaders and colleagues, they will be more likely to use these same principles when interacting with resource families. This slide then illustrates the parallel process of providing good customer service to both internal and external customers and the end result of support for resource families as well as for children and youth and their families. Because staff are supported and valued, they are better able to give families the services and support they need. When resource families receive this support from staff, they are more likely to continue to work with the agency and ultimately to help children and youth achieve the goals of safety, permanency, and well-being. Creating a culture that engages and supports both internal and external customers and that includes resource families in both of these roles is a systemic issue. It goes much deeper than just the behaviors of individual staff. We've created this graphic to show what we call the PRO framework for customer service. There are three components to which a system must depend in order to achieve good customer service. The P in PRO is for processes. This dimension refers to the process steps involved and procedures implemented as we deliver child welfare services, such as responding to inquiries in a timely manner, reducing wait time for services, and in general, delivering services in a way that is customer-centered. The next element is R for relationships. Effective working relationships are the heart of the PRO framework. 
putting emphasis on the competencies needed to build and sustain trusting and respectful relationships is crucial to engaging and supporting families. And finally, organization. As we've discussed, the climate and organizational culture throughout the agency sets the stage for good customer service. A total organizational commitment from the top down and from staff members at all levels is fundamental to assuring an agency implements good customer service for both internal and external customers. In the next few slides, we're going to quickly lay out the 10 principles of the PRO framework. These principles reflect many of the ideas we've been talking about so far today, and you will hear about them in action shortly when Angie and Becky share examples from state and tri tribal child welfare programs. First, we have principles related to processes. The first one, as we said, good customer service really is everyone's business. It's more than just a one-time feel-good project, and it's the responsibility of more than a single department or a few individuals within an agency. It requires a systemic approach for integrating customer service principles throughout an agency's structure, structures, policies, and practices. Second is listening to the voice of the customer. Providing resource families with opportunities to provide input and listening to what they say is an important way to guide customer service improvement. And third is effective use of data. Good customer service is grounded in collecting and using data to guide our work. Knowing the real needs and characteristics of children in care and the pool of kin, foster, and adoptive families helps agencies to fine-tune recruitment strategies and to respond to the support needs of their existing families. The next set of principles address relationships. And number four is relationships work. As we know, true partnerships evolve over time and are nurtured by mutual trust and positive experiences. The fifth is partners and service. Success in meeting case goals depends on real family engagement and teamwork. Families are more likely to collaborate and be responsive to agency requests when treated as valued members of the team. This involves considering what families need in order to be able to participate fully. For example, involving families in the process of selecting a meeting time that actually works for everyone, rather than notifying them last minute about a meeting they may not be able to fit in with their work schedule. And the sixth is use of power. Power and empowerment often play a much bigger role in child welfare than in other services because of the dual mandate of protecting children and serving families. Families' perceptions and experiences are that professionals generally have more power and authority. And we need to actively seek ways to empower families as much as possible when we work together. Next, the principles address organizational factors. Number seven is organization, organizational climate and culture. When leaders, managers, supervisors, and staff create, model, and support an environment of mutual respect, shared responsibility, and partnership, then a foundation is set for the delivery of good customer service, which leads to eight, an empowering style of leadership. As we've noted, customer service requires that leaders empower and support their staff members to carry out competent service delivery. Good customer service must lie in the hands and the hearts of all staff members who interact with internal and external customers. There also needs to be an agency-wide commitment to supporting those staff members in providing good customer service. Nine, meaningful customer service standards. Customer service standards, priorities, and expectations need to be communicated and reinforced consistently throughout the child welfare agency and community, including through hiring, training, and performance review processes for staff. And finally, number 10, core competencies for customer service. The PRO framework incorporates attitudes, skills, and knowledge, including cultural competencies, that can be learned and reinforced at all levels of the agency to support and sustain good customer service. These competencies recognize the emotional content and highly sensitive nature of child welfare work and build on the strengths of families and children. The principles mention customer service standards, and we recommend establishing customer service standards and behavioral expectations for all staff that go along with them as an effective way of oper operationalizing the PRO framework and embedding effective engagement and support strategies throughout an agency. Written customer service standards reflect the organization's values regarding service 
and are rooted in the agency's practice model when one is in place. In order to be an effective tool for guiding staff members, the standards need to be prioritized, specific to the work and roles of various staff members, and they need to include clear definitions and details on behaviors that an agency expects of its staff members. When staff members at all levels, including frontline staff and leadership, know the behaviors that are expected of them to operationalize the agency's customer service standards, they're better equipped to provide a good customer service experience, even in challenging situations. Angie will be sharing Mississippi's experiences in developing customer service standards in just a few minutes. Here is an example of some of the areas in which child welfare agencies may establish customer service standards. And they're shown in the prioritized order in which the standards are generally applied. Each agency needs to establish their own standards, however, with the input of internal and external customers and in keeping with the real work scenarios that its staff encounters. Your agency might develop somewhat different standards and a different prioritization in order to ensure that your standards align with your practice model, agency structure, and other important considerations. So let's do another poll. And this one is going to let you think a little bit about how you would prioritize the three standards that we list here, three, three areas for standards, mission, responsiveness, and respect. So if you have to prioritize those, how would you do it? Wow. So far, responsiveness first is leading the way. And continues to do so. I think we can go ahead and close that. Um, it's clear that all of these areas are important. And um, you know, certainly we understand that how priorities are de uh, determined are going to look different for each agency. But when you're doing this in real time, of course, you're going to have some um, partnering with your many stakeholders, internal and external customers, to help figure out what those priorities should, uh, should be. Here you can see two examples of the type of formal written standards that can be developed to address different topic areas. You'll see one for authority and power and one for responsiveness and timeliness. Once an agency has produced standards like this, the next step will be to prepare a list of specific staff behaviors to implement each standard in day-to-day -day practice. Later in this webinar, we'll point you to a resource to help you with the nuts and bolts of creating customer service standards for your agency. As we finish up our discussion of key, key concepts, we would like to focus on considerations for implementing a customer service approach in a way that has the greatest opportunity for success. The field of implementation science provides a wealth of information about common elements and successful implementation efforts. Implementation science tells us that it's important to consider all of the competency, leadership, and organizational drivers that will affect the development and sustainability of your customer service approach. In a practical way, this means making a plan for the implementation process, including all of the right people and roles from the beginning. In this case, it means involving kin, foster, and adoptive families, as well as staff from multiple divisions and levels, and possibly other stakeholders as well. Investing the time to be thorough in the planning phase can head off roadblocks and can be anticipated and avoided. This probably means thinking about what system elements, what system elements, policies, data tracking, and other components are currently in place to provide good customer service, along with the elements that may need to be created or improved. The planning phase can involve considering the challenges you could encounter and how you might address them. It may also involve analyzing available data or gathering new data if it is needed to inform your work. For instance, your agency might use a survey to learn about customer service-related challenges that foster parents currently experience. It's also important to make a commitment to allowing the time needed to implement a customer service approach. As we know, implementation of any new approach does take time, especially when it involves changing organizational culture. Since customer service usually speaks to the way we do the things we do, it's important to connect it to other initiatives and ongoing work streams rather than positioning it as a standalone effort that might be abandoned when some newer idea comes along. Finally, 
We'd like to quickly share a few of the strategies that we have seen work effectively in systems that have implemented a customer service approach to supporting and engaging resource camps. These include, first, prioritizing areas to work on. Given that you can't do everything at once, what can you do first to have the greatest impact? Understanding and acknowledging how parts of the work are related to each other and affect each other really helps you to decide how to sequence and prioritize your efforts. Working on creating, operationalizing, and prioritizing customer service standards like we've discussed that cover all roles and positions in the agency always seems to be an important step to making real improvements in how families perceive they are treated. And finally, considering the cultural dynamics of your agency and community, understanding what your customers, internal and external, really want will help you to develop customer service standards that are meaningful for both staff and families. Now I'm going to pass it over to Becky Ming, who will discuss putting customer service into practice in tribal communities. Thank you, Maureen. We see many tribal child welfare systems using customer service approaches in holistic, community-based ways, even if they aren't using the term customer service to describe their approach to empowering staff and engaging families. In my presentation, I'll describe some examples of ways that tribal child welfare systems implement some of the customer service concepts that Maureen reviewed, which we believe can be relevant and helpful for both tribal and state child welfare systems. Tribal customer service encompasses the child and all the key people and elements that are relevant to the child. Customer service is woven into all aspects of child welfare practice delivery, thereby making the work more relational, engaging, and supportive to all involved. You can see that one of the circles surrounding the child is culturally relevant services. The way in which tribal nations put customer service into practice is often based on that tribe's values and beliefs. Tribal leadership, and particularly elders, want to ensure tribal membership and community needs are being met. I'm going to provide several examples of how tribes have put some of the elements of the PRO framework of customer service into practice, or how some of these concepts may apply to the approach to child welfare in tribal communities. The PRO framework says, good customer service is everybody's business, as Maureen shared earlier. Many tribes are cognizant of valuing every person in their community as each person has a role in their family and as a community member. Respect is a cultural value that is all encompassing in the teaching, traditions, relationships, and communication. Cultural values are important for developing working relationships with resource families, biological families, children, extended family, and also with the community. Listening and responding to the voices of our customers can result in stronger communication, better coordination of services, informed decision making, flexibility, and more culturally relevant services. One example of how a tribal child welfare system listened to the voice of a family was being responsive to the type of support a resource family said would help them to meet the needs of a child in their care. In this example, a resource family asked their foster care staff what they can do to further enhance the child's cultural connection to their tribe. As a result, staff developed a foster parent training session that had cultural teachers come in to discuss seasons and what their people had done in those seasons that included harvesting and storing certain foods, traditional foods. Also, the importance of children knowing their families, their people, the oral teachings, the rites of passage ceremonies, etc. Another way of listening and being responsive to the voice of the customer is to allow some flexibility in the provision of services. Providing flexibility is a way to utilize services and staff time to accommodate a client's needs. This, this encourages reliability and consistency of service delivery rather than a rigid work schedule that can result in staff being unavailable to assist the family in need. For example, one tribal agency adjusted a staff person's schedule to meet the needs of a resource family so they could do a home visiting while providing supportive services to the resource family 
when they were home in the early evening. SAS can be developed to use a relational approach by understanding where families are coming from, who their families are, and where their families are, so that services are geared toward meeting the needs of the child, family, and resource family. For example, a tribal agency who has knowledge of who their families are, they can best identify if a family is a traditional or non-traditional, or sometimes both, so they know how to provide culturally relevant services and to also promote meaningful customer services to the family and resource families, whether they are relative or non-relative. In one tribal system, supervisors were able to strengthen customer service and better meet the needs of staff by allowing staff to support one another in their work. They also encourage staff to think about the question, if this was your child or grandchild, how would you like them to be treated? Supervisors message this by using specific examples so staff could relate to and be cognizant of how they are working with their children and families. By being very hands-on with their staff, supervisors were able to evaluate how staff interact and provide services to their clients. For example, a supervisor, staff, and a family would meet to go over concerns that a family member had regarding a placement of a child. The staff could see how the supervisor models language of concerns and strength and the importance of how information is shared and communicated. This could allow for the supervisor to meet with the staff person after the meeting to debrief and provide the guidance of integrating respect and meeting the client where they were. Another example of how a tribal agency put relationships first was when someone in their community passed. Stafford requests an emergency staff in to discuss a plan of action should the parent or immediate family request that the children be in attendance for the funeral services. Recognition of loss also meant staff were to follow up with the resource family to include them because the funeral services and grief processes would now start for the child and their family. This process would not include the resource family if they were not a relative placement. For example, one child went to the funeral service and the foster family was able to attend through a request made by the ICW program with the family who lost their loved one. This allowed the child, the child's family, and the resource family to start the grief process and to be respectful of one another as this encouraged the relationship and supported the child. Engaging the community can be another way of putting relationships first. A tribal agency that was facing a negative perception of their role in the community addressed this challenge by making an effort to build a stronger relationship with the community. They provided the community with increased information and transparency about the role of the agency. They promoted year-round awareness and had engaged families in social events such as the Family Fun Day with guest presenters, water activities and games, or participating in health fairs, which supported recruitment of resource families, and they also provided family strengthening resources in the community, such as training to prevent child welfare involvement. Cross-training can help staff to be partners in providing good customer service. Some tribal agencies are small and are cross-training their tribal staff. For instance, they train staff to treat their clients and anyone who comes across the ICW program with respect by returning calls as soon as possible. If a staff member is not available or is on leave, a client should not be turned away, so another staff person who is available will be able to assist that client. This creates prompt response, common courtesy for clients who walk through the door or make that call to the program. This approach also models user-friendly services for example, a prompt response is crucial to a resource family who may be caring for a child who is in need of transportation to an important medical appointment, while the resource family has to stay home to continue caring for the other children in their home. Resource families are confront comforted knowing that they can reach their designated ICW staff person or anyone else if they have an immediate need by phone, email, or in person. Family group decision making can provide a framework for staff and families to become partners in service. There's a tribe who incorporated the Maori Indigenous Family Group Conferencing model as a way to integrate a wraparound program 
whose services were specific to developing staff, have, having leadership model support of their staff and meeting the needs of children, families, resource families, and the community. The family group conferencing models, the concept of families know families best, empowering families and developing staff so that they were cognizant of respect, cultural values, and empowering families. Family group conferencing was also used as a vehicle for families to develop their own plan. For example, the family can identify family placement of children who are tribal or for equal cases as this helps streamline efforts for placement preferences while doing this in a respectful and timely manner with the family. Another benefit of cross-training and family group group decision-making is that these approaches can improve customer service by increasing transparency and creating opportunities for sharing power. Staff can more readily provide families with information about timelines and processes for when and how decisions or plans can be made and, it can, get, and can engage them in some of these processes. In the system that implemented family group decision making, they used weekly staff meetings as a way to support child welfare practice through team decision making for relative searches, placement, approval, denial of foster care certifications, and also to create ways to support families and resource families. Staff were also used links and modeling. The language of concerns, issues, and strengths when working with the families. And this meant being respectful, open, honest, and not having any hidden agenda or surprises. This fostered empowerment and not focusing on problems, created best thinking, promotes the idea that everyone should be treated with respect and courtesy, plus emphasizes that families know their own family. They are the experts. Another example of how customer service can support strengthened work with families is if families are informed about foster care certification requirements and criteria needed to get certified, they are able to make the decision knowing what is involved. Agencies can help resource families understand processes so they are informed and are able to meet the ICW program needs for certification. For example, if the community is informed about the criminal history criteria, they would not second guess if they would pass the criminal history check. Developing thoughtful policies and procedures and orienting staff about them is one way to integrate culturally relevant practice and strong customer service. For example, if a birth parent does not want their child's haircut because of their tradition, Respect for this preference could be built in the policy and procedures. This could be emphasized in foster care certification standards and tied into developing foster parents as a way to integrate the tribe's cultural values so that this is upheld. This approach by the agency can help staff to provide good customer service to the birth family and child by respecting their cultural traditions and to the foster parent by providing guidance and development to meet the needs of a child in their care. Offering opportunities for support and development is another important component of creating an organizational climate and culture that supports customer service. For instance, if staff are familiar with child welfare practice through training or other learning opportunities, they are more likely to be responsive and proactive in meeting the needs of children and families. An example of this could be leadership modeling with their staff in a staff meeting, open communication, which could be changes in child welfare practice where a new federal law could impact how they provide services at both a tribal and state level. By sharing this information, staff are informed and not surprised when there are changes to the work that they did as a team prior. Again, in the system that implemented family group decision making, if a caseworker had a concern with their case and went to their supervisor, the supervisor would then ask what the concern was about. Rather than taking a punitive approach, the supervisor can take time to listen, communicate, be available, and guide staff in a way that fits in cultural values. The supervisor could listen to the caseworker and ask clarifying questions and then they could ask the staff what their best thinking would be. 
this would allow the caseworker the opportunity to think for themselves and yet have supervisory support in their decision making. There would be other times where a caseworker had a concern and a supervisor would suggest having an emergency staffing for all input and decision making from staff so that there is feedback coming from everyone. This would then support the caseworker with an informed team decision, making it a we or us decision rather than a me or I decision where the caseworker has full responsibility and the information being relayed back to the family would be uniform message of a team decision made. Knowing that each tribe is unique, customer service and culturally relevant approaches to child welfare can be integrated into staff development, policies and procedures, from prevention to post-permanency in order to best engage and meet the needs of children, youth, and families. Here's my contact information. If you want to reach out to me, now I'll turn it over to Angie Williams from Mississippi for her presentation. Thank you, everybody. Hey everyone, um, this is Angie Williams and I am the Permanency Director in Family and Children's Services at the Mississippi Department of Human Services. I work in the state office, or many of you would refer to it as the central office. My team and I provide program and policy support in the areas of adoption, foster care, congregate care, 4E eligibility, eligibility and diligent recruitment. I am the co-lead on Mississippi's diligent recruitment grant. We are in the fifth and final year of the grant. My presentation today will focus primarily on our work to develop and implement a customer service curriculum. I want to emphasize that training is important, but training alone will not ensure or enable high quality customer service agency-wide. Training is one element of a systemic approach to implementing customer service. To be effective, as Maureen and Becky said, customer service must be everyone's business and must be a priority for the agency leadership that is integrated into all of the work. So I want to get in on the poll question action too. So my question for you is, in your current job, do you have customer service related expectations or standards for how you perform your job or your role? Wow, that is an impressive 90% yes. Um, I think for most of us, there is some expectation to provide good customer service, whether we are lucky enough to have that in writing um, to guide us through our specific job description or not um, is up in the air, but not for most of you though. Most of you have that. I want to give you um, a little context for um, how we operate in Mississippi um, and just a little, a little bit of a, an administrative setup if you'll indulge. Mississippi is a state-administered, county-based child welfare system. Mississippi is made up of 13 regions, each with seven to nine counties. We have a large geographic area with between four and 5,000 children in foster care, which for some of you will seem um, big, like a big number, but for others that will be quite small. In 2010, when Mississippi was awarded the Diligent Recruitment Grant, we were already working with a consulting group known as the Center for the Support of Families. Um, among other things, they were helping us implement a new practice model statewide. So we were fortunate enough to pull in CSF to help us develop our grant implementation plan. And one of the first things they did was a media search to establish public perception of Mississippi Department of Human Services and foster care in general in our state. This way we would know what we were recruiting against. At the time, Mississippi was just two years into the implementation of a federal settlement agreement. The state had been sued in 2004 by children's rights. We settled in 2008, and in 2010, we were neck deep in it. You won't be surprised to know that public perception was not good. In 2011, we received technical assistance from the NRC and Adopt US Kids to help us develop a customer service curriculum and training. We developed a half day training it is a simple curriculum that focuses on the basics of customer service, how that relates to recruiting and retaining resource parents, and why resource parents are so important to us in our work. I will probably say this again during my presentation. Um, customer service is a simple concept. 
it's not rocket science. Um, and I think we all often wonder why is it so hard to do. Our training begins with seven belief statements that I think are critical in setting the tone of the training. I think the belief statements are a reality check for staff. The Mississippi Department of Human Services believes people are innately good and want to do their best work. Building relationships in our workplaces with our customers and in our lives is a primary goal. We always have choices in how we act and respond. Everyone can make a difference, no matter what their job or position in the agency. At the end of the day, all the frustrations and headaches, these seven things are the foundations of good human interaction. Lifelong learning, creative thinking, the gift of appreciation, enthusiasm is contagious, and we can all find meaning in our work, and we are all here to serve. In developing the curriculum, we spent a lot of time discussing the question, who are our customers? And just like Maureen described earlier, we ultimately decided that the principles of good customer service applied as much to our coworkers and community partners as it did to resource parents. We are all so intricately connected in this line of work, you almost cannot exclude one without excluding the others. We developed our own principles of customer service that we nicknamed the five R's. I won't say that we prioritize the five R's because they are not in any real order, but I will say that it's no accident that responsive and reliable are the top two. These are the ones that we find staff struggle the most to meet, and these are the two that people are most likely to voice concern about. While the other three are important, it is my experience and observation that if staff are responsible and reliable, then folks are more likely to be forgiving of the, if the others are lacking. The other three principles are respect, relationship, and recognition. The first session of the curriculum we call customer service basics is structured around these five principles. This is an example of one of the PowerPoint slides from session one. Again, it is not rocket science. I think 80% of our customer service issues would go away if folks just answered the phone and returned people's calls. We get a lot of complaints from staff who attend our training, I will be honest with you. We hear things like, this isn't anything I don't already know. And I'm disappointed to tell you that this is one of the lowest attended trainings that we offer. This is one of the lessons we've learned. It's not enough to recognize the problem or even to offer the training. Good customer service and whatever strategy you come up with to address it has to be a priority for agency leadership. I want to emphasize this point that offering training alone isn't enough. You even acknowledged as much in your, the responses to the earlier poll question about how frequently um, le your leadership talks about customer service. Many of you said they talk about it um, frequently. It takes leadership commitment to make customer service a priority within the agency culture and infrastructure and to provide staff with the support they need to be able to provide good customer service. Unfortunately, as in most things in our work, the challenge is prioritizing the priorities. Here are some of the other factors or behaviors that can create a negative impression with customers. Making the customer wait, not answering the phone promptly, not saying please or thank you, speaking loudly or condescendingly, making faces, frowning, acting distant, not smiling. I would add rolling your eyes to that list as well looking disheveled or like you don't care about your appearance, a poor handshake, focusing on another task while addressing or servicing a customer. Each region in Mississippi is staffed with county workers who are the frontline workers and resource workers who are our licensure and adoption workers. Resource families have to work with county staff who are the children's workers and with licensure staff whom they know the best and have interacted with for several months, but who have nothing to do with the children's cases. In too many of our counties and regions, there is a sharp divide between county and resource staff. There may be a difference in practice, one worker taking shortcuts, not following policy, while the other tries to do things the right way. 
the resource family gets conflicting information and doesn't know what to expect from the agency or what they should be doing. Sometimes frontline workers and resource workers don't communicate or collaborate, or worse, they are openly at odds with one another. The blame game ensues and the needs of the resource family go unmet. Resource families often get caught in the middle um, between staff. If agency staff can think of one another as their customer and apply customer service principles and strategies with coworkers, then our external customers, our birth families, our resource families, and our community stakeholders are the ones who benefit most from improved practice. In session two, we focus mostly on how good customer service impacts our resource families. We talk a good bit about resource parents as recruiters, as Maureen and Becky mentioned, the role of resource families and the work that we do, and the impact of good customer service on maltreatment and care rates. We also talk about how resource families help us achieve the outcomes that we want with children and families. You didn't think you would have a presentation from a National Resource Center without reference to the CSSR, did you? The customer service training is just one way that we are trying to help, our, help staff see our resource families as partners in this work and not as babysitters. I want to just, as I'm wrapping up, I want to share some lessons learned, um, things that I've mentioned before, but I'll just review here on this slide. Good customer service must be a priority from the top down at all levels of the agency. Data is important in establishing the need for good customer service, and as Maureen mentioned earlier, data regarding recruitment and retention is not always available. Good relationships and good communication between frontline staff and resource staff is a must. Our Mississippi's Customer Service Workshop Manual Simple Truths of Service slideshow, the tracking form that we've used, and surveys um, that we developed early on um, are available in the 2010 Diligent Recruitment Grantee section of the NRCDR website. They are also included on the web page for this webinar. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Maureen to talk about some additional resources. Thank you, Angie. Before we open the floor for questions and discussion, um, we'd like to share some resources that may assist you in strengthening customer service. Um, our National Resource Center for Diligent Recruitment at Adopt US Kids website is a good place to start. Once you navigate to the website, you will find information about implementing a customer service model in the Develop and Support Family section of our website. A variety of resources on improving family development and support can be, found in the, can be found in the Tools and Resources page within that website section. And you can see our web address up there. Now let's take a quick look at some specific resources, all of which you can view and download for free on the website. As a start, more detailed information on the ideas discussed in today's webinar can be found in the booklet using customer service concepts to enhance recruitment and retention practices. In addition to providing an overview of customer service concepts, this publication contains several practical tools that, among other things, will walk an agency through a series of steps to review its current policies and practices, guide the development of customer service standards, and outline a process to implement improved approaches to better engage and support resource families. You might also want to take a look at one of the newest resources from Adopt US Kids uh, entitled Support Matters, Lessons from the Field on Services for Foster, Adoptive, Foster, and Kinship Care Families. This publication highlights successful family support efforts, promising practices, and data from across the country. Just a few more resources that you might find helpful in tracking and using resource family data include um, data-driven recruitment, key data elements on foster and adoptive families in our archived webinar, Data-Driven Diligent Recruitment, Partnering and Prioritizing to Strengthen Your System's Use of Data. And as you can see, you can find all of those on the website as well. Um, you'll also find on our website many materials from the field developed by Children's Bureau Diligent Recruitment grantees like Mississippi and other states 
um, but you can use this template for examples to support your work, and you can see um, examples from uh, several years' worth of grantees there. And finally, to finish up our tour of resources, um, here are three tip sheets that you may want to check out. Um, there's one related to phone interaction with families, um, one on uh, strengthening prospective parent orientation sessions, and finally, um, every month is Customer Service Month that gives you ideas of little things you can do throughout the month that really do improve your practice. Um, the National Resource Center for Diligent Recruitment at Adopt US Kids is able to provide capacity building services, coaching, resources, and other support to states, tribes, and territories to assist with your work to implement customer service concepts, utilize data, and strengthen your recruitment support and development of families. For more information about how we can help, visit our website or contact us at the email address or phone number provided here. I'm going to pass it over to Jill now so that we can have some questions and discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Maureen. Um, we're now going to um, start answering some of the questions that you've been submitting during the webinar. Um, and I'll ask um, the entire panel to answer some of these questions. Um, so we'll do sort of a round robin here. Um, the first question we have is, um, how long did it take to generate buy-in into customer service concepts in child care agencies? Did you have a kickoff event or some way to get people on the same page? Um, that sounds like it might be a direct question for Angie, but I'm going to um, answer it as well. Um, I think that um, all new initiatives are, are best um, uh, implemented when you bring all levels of um, child welfare workers to the table to talk about it, to, to get everybody engaged and, and talking about it from the very beginning. Um, so um, a lot of agencies have developed um, customer service standards into their practice model, um, which then holds, um, um, gives it some more um, 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 bang, I guess, uh, for lack of better words. But Angie, do you want to talk a little bit about how you um, started your initiative? Sure. So Jennifer, how long does it take to generate buy-in? I don't know. I'll let you know when we have. Um, I'm joking, of course. But it is, it is an ongoing challenge. And I can put energy and effort into um, one region or a, a few counties and see you know, real progress and then I move on to another region or another little county area, and um, that, that one comes along, but the one I was just in begins to kind of you know, wane. Um, it, it just for us has, it has become evident that it is an ongoing battle to maintain a high level of good customer service. It just requires a lot of focus and energy on the part of, of leadership. Um, we did not have um, a big kickoff event when we rolled out the customer service training. We, of course, developed this as a part of our diligent recruitment grant. So we, we rolled it out with the licensure staff, the folks who were out in the regions doing the recruitment. And so the grant staff trained all of the licensure staff across the state. We just loaded up the car, um, had our handy dandy little PowerPoint and all of our cute handouts and we um, just toured the state and did the training and had great feedback from staff about it. Um, we then passed it off to our professional development slash training unit um, for the whole state, and they added it to their schedule of ongoing trainings. It is available to all staff at all levels across the state. It's offered once a quarter um, every year. You, um, our staff are required to have ongoing training hours, so this is a part of one of the ways that the agency helps them to get that. And we were able to get our customer service training approved for a few social work continuing education hours. So not for the full three or four hours, I think an hour and a half, half of it or something like that, we were able to get social work hours for. So that, that also helps um, generate some interest because people have something to gain from it other than just the benefit of learning good customer service. So Angie, it uh, looks like you're pretty popular in these questions, so I'm going to ask you another one here. 
Um, so is Mississippi okay with other states taking on the five R's concept? Um, we have developed a customer service training that has already been trained, um, but I really like the five R's. Um, any of the materials that we've developed through the um, diligent recruitment grant um, are on the on the grant website, the National Resource Center website, and y'all can use those however you see fit. Um, we're happy to share. If you can tweak them and make them better, that's great. We'd love to know about it um, because maybe we want to learn from you too. But we're glad for you to use our five R's and claim them as your own. Thanks, Angie. Um, another question came in about just wondering how the presenters overcame resistance to implementing a customer service initiative. Um, Maureen, why don't you kick this one off? Um, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that I think is really helpful is having uh, planning teams around your customer service efforts that include people from uh, different parts of the agency and different levels and positions within the agency, as well as resource families and in some cases even older youth or maybe birth families, depending on um, you know, what it is you're trying to address. Uh, I think when people can hear from their peers um, about the effort and get some encouragement, um, they, they can buy into that a little better than when it's, you know, just sort of coming from the, down, from the top down and feels as though just another uh, requirement being put on them with, uh, you know, kind of um, along with everything else they have to do. So I would say just, you know, empower and engage people as much as you can um, in that effort. And the other thing I would say is, you know, make it kind of fun. Um, I do think the idea of kickoff events where that are short, that don't take too much time out of people day, people's day, but maybe have some refreshments and uh, kind of get people jazzed up, acknowledges the efforts they always make, remind, you know, remind everybody how much we need those caregiving families, how much they help us in our job, how lost we are without them, and then maybe in addition have a panel of um, caregiving parents talk who really speak from their hearts, and I found that people really can engage with that, and um, it helps them then to you know keep going with the work. Angie, did you want to add anything something? to that one? Absolutely. Uh, just, thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, so I sort of want to speak to that and address a question, if I can do kill two birds with one stone, that Mary Bryan asked about how do you how do you get over that people not attending or being reluctant. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do um, is take it away from the state level and offer, because it is such a short training, um, the PowerPoint and the materials, we've tried to make them available widely to the county supervisors so that they could use those in um, their, their staff meetings. Things that they could pull out, maybe not do the whole training, but if there were pieces that they were seeing their staff struggle with or they were getting a lot of complaints about something, we've tried to encourage um, the, the leadership at the local level um, to focus on it and use the materials that we have. Great, thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions related to um, um, tribes. Um, one question specific about whether what kind of help the NRC can offer. Um, I would say to to reach out to Becky, um, or you can you can email um, nrcdr at adoptuskids.org. Um, and, and, and have a conversation with us about the type of help that you're interested in. Um, we do offer direct assistance. We have two um, folks that work with us that um, specifically specialize in tribal recruitment, so we, we welcome you um, to reach out to us and we can see how we can, um, we can help. Becky, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, you, you covered that. Great, thank uh, you. I just yeah, you contact me by email or by phone. I got a work phone and a work cell number, so I'm available either or. Um, we also have a couple of questions about data. Um, one question is what kind of data is useful for driving customer service um, and retention data? Um, I'll ask all of you to jump in. But the one thing that, that I would like to say about that is, is that um, I encourage you to go to our website um, for the diligent recruitment grantees. Several of them have um, established surveys, um, and I think that that's one thing that really can can help um, 
with getting buy-in from staff is to see and hear um, what foster parents are saying um, about the services that they're receiving. So that's one way. Um, lots of jurisdictions are um, um, getting retention data through exit surveys. Um, I'm, not I'm not sure if that's specifically what you're asking, um, but finding out why are people leaving the agency. Um, um, anything, uh, Maureen, that you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think surveys definitely give you information about people's um, experiences, and then you can track trends over time and see if you're actually making progress. Um, if you're targeting, you know, improvements, you can actually see maybe with, if you're surveying um, on a regular basis, um, if you can see any changes in that. Um, as Jill said, on our website, we do have some tools related to um, tracking some of the quantitative data as well, and I think really keeping track of how families are coming in and then um, making their way through the whole process towards licensing or certification or approval and identifying where and then those initial stages where there might be roadblocks and addressing those and then also using data on the dynamics of your um, foster family pool so you know you know who's accepting placements who's not who's leaving and you know you can start to explore if there's any trends there or things that are related to customer service so just that combination it also allows you to, I think, narrow it down to it to um, different areas of your state, or if you're a county-based system, about um, maybe um, some people are leaving in one area area of the state for for one reason, and they're leaving for another reason for in another part of your state. Um, so I think it also allows you to sort of nail down specific strategies that may have to be implemented in different in different areas. I think another, this is Becky, I think another um, consideration in, in regard to data too is asking, you know, like state systems and um, how are, how is that um, customer service look at, you know, when um, ICWA cases come to play and that customer service, you know, between the agencies is really another important consideration as well in that relationship and um, how to, you know, our tribal agencies, um, or not tribal agencies, sorry, our state agencies um, tracking and identifying their data in a sense of, um, you know, that partnership and that coordination um, effort for meeting the needs of, you know, tribal partners as well as tribal families. Great. Thank you, Becky. Angie, anything you wanted to add to that? Well, just to say that um, I wish there was an easy answer to this question. Um, I can more, t I mean, I think I can tell you what we wish we had. Um, so we are, our, our, we call it MACWIS, our Mississippi Automated Child Welfare Information System, um, isn't able to give us, the, it, the system itself doesn't generate reports related to recruitment. Um, but if it, if it did, I'm not sure that the staff enter, the licensure staff put the data in there that we need to pull out. Um, of course, that may be a chicken and egg question. Maybe they would enter it if there was something the system could do with it. Neither here nor there, though. Um, so we we developed a tracking log to help us um, keep up with some data. We developed a, an inquiry form that we use. Um, it's a form that each worker fills out on um, every inquiry that they take. The tracking log is more for supervisors or more for a worker to use to manage their caseload to know where a particular applicant is in the process. We discovered through the work of our diligent recruitment grant that we really have no way to access where a family is in the process or at what point they drop out. So like other states, we're doing an exit survey um, with a handful of resource parents to find out why they've dropped out or why they quit. But other than us doing that survey, we, we couldn't even tell you when they quit or where they quit in the licensure process. Um, so it's, it's, the struggle is real. Great. Thanks, Angie. Um, one question that's come in is what strategies were used to re-engage staff that have lost buy-in? Um, 
I don't know. I don't know that this answer completely addresses um, this question, um, but I know that many states, to really um, implement this and embed it into the, to their culture and the way they they do business, is um, speaks to one of our poll questions was is that they've written customer service standards into performance um, uh, evaluations or job descriptions that really defines for people what is expected. Um, I think, um, I think as Angie said, you know, there's an expectation that we provide good customer service, but many jurisdictions don't have that written into any formal way into to job description. So I think, you know, that may be one way to to, to build um, some expectations. I think another thing that Maureen um, alluded to was just the whole idea of bringing people to the table. Um, to include foster families and youth and and staff to talk about um, you know what's working and what's not working. Um, I think that that can be really powerful for families and for staff to hear um, you know how it is um, to have a child placed in your home without any information or to have a, a, a staff tell a foster family, um, you don't know how hard it is when you leave five voicemails and I haven't been in the office for three days. Um, so I think just to, to start having and engaging in those conversations can really help um, increase empathy um, towards where each other are coming from. So that, that's one suggestion I would have. Um, Maureen or, or any of the other presenters have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to add, too, that I think some of the places that have um, really thought about this also comes back to thinking about staff in their role as an internal customer and really, um, you know, recognizing the um, really stressful nature of their jobs, the um, secondary trauma that many um, child welfare staff are experiencing. And so part of the way I think um, of reengaging staff with being able to be responsive in serving kids and families is figuring out um, how it is that they can be supported and assisted within the agency in doing the hard work that they do, which I know is not a real concrete answer, but I think you kind of have to hold both sides of it. I think just also being um, leaders being available, um, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, some tribes have learned is, you know, management by wandering around, some of those concepts of, you know, um, if there some uh, issue arises, addressing it as it happens, inquiring, you know, following up with your families and having that discussion with the staff and just reiterating, um, you know, the buy-in of, you know, the importance of, you know, the customer service you know, like the example used in a presentation was, you know, if this was your child or your grandchild, how would you like to be treated? And, you know, reiterate the importance of, you know, if you were on the receiving end, you know, taking that into consideration. And also just being there um, if they're interacting with families and, you know, just meeting afterwards to debrief to say what worked really well, you know, maybe work on this. Um, and, you know, using those opportunities as learning moments as well. Great. Thanks, Becky. We've got um, a couple specific questions for you again, Angie. One is, do you think it would be effective to train leadership supervisors in, in the agency on customer service and then have them uh, train their own staff? I, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, Ellen, I love the question. I love the idea. Um, the other piece that I might would add to that is to say train supervisors and leaders to incorporate customer service into their um, staffing, staffing consultation with their own staff. So as you're going through a case, I mean, one of the things that you should, could be looking at with the worker is at what points are you providing or not providing good customer service, and where could that have made a difference in um, the placement disruption, or whatever is going, you know, whatever happens to be the crisis of the moment. Maureen, anything you'd like to add to that in terms of ways to roll out? Um, I, I think probably, you know, it's both and. So um, 
you know, I think it is important to have some of um, when you develop, for instance, a training or learning opportunity to have that institutionalized into however your jurisdiction provides uh, learning opportunities to new staff and then ongoing. But then I really love the idea of having people, um, I think it's really helpful to have the um, supervisors and managers be really well versed in this and then they share this in maybe smaller bites um, as um, part of unit meetings or um, when issues arise. So I think both would be great. Um, we have one specific question. I think it's for you, Angie. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, and what curriculum do you use for pre-service resource family training? We um, actually use a, a modified version of PATH, Parents as Tender Healers. A um, hundred years ago, whenever we selected that, we worked with Spalding to adapt it um, to some Mississippi-specific issues. And we actually updated and revised that a year or so, a year or two years ago, um, to incorporate some of our diligent recruitment and customer service concepts. Um, we added a little more on diversity and trauma, shared parenting, um, that kind of thing. I'd, I'd be happy to share a copy of the manual if you would like it. You can um, email me. Oh, great. Maybe I should put my email address up here. You can also email us at the, um, I've said this before and don't mean to be redundant, but nrcdr at adoptuskids.org and we can provide to you all the trainings that we're aware of that are, um, that are happening and, and contact information for people. Um, so another question is, um, so much emphasis on data-driven recruitment these days. What do we do when our IT system does not have the capacity to support the types of information that these data-driven initiatives are requesting? Um, so I, I think one um, thing that we've already talked about a little bit was the idea of, of qualitative data, of doing surveys, of doing exit surveys. Um, um, I think that that's one way that you can do things outside of an IT system. Um, Maureen, other other strategies? I think that um, that's right. I mean, you, you know, kind of work with what you have. Um, I think also it's helpful to see what people are doing locally. I've really found that sometimes even if your state um, or, you know, if you're a large tribe, your IT system might not um, have this capacity, but you may find that people in local offices or in counties or regions actually have developed some sort of a tracking tool that sometimes they're not real forthcoming about because they may think they're going to get in trouble. <laughs> so uh, I think when I, uh, you know, convening the people who are interested in data and seeing what they're doing already and seeing if actually sometimes you find out you do have more information than you think. And um, I've also found that sometimes the IT and data people really can be responsive if we can help them to understand like maybe some information is tracked in your system and they don't have a report coming out. And if we could help them to understand why this, you know, why some particular piece of information, you know, would serve our agency well that, you know, sometimes you're able to start to build what you need just bit by bit. Thanks, Maureen. Um, one question just came in about any suggestions on how to engage support Kin relative uh, placement providers um, as soon as placement occurs. Um, one thing that Maureen um, mentioned during the resource section of the webinar was we've just released, the Adoptionist Kids has just released um, a publication called Support Matters, which has over 30 best and promising practices across the country in um, supporting families um, post placement and and post-permanency. So if you go to the nrcdr.org website, um, you can find that. So that will give you many, many different ideas. Um, anything specific, uh, Maureen or Angie or Becky, you'd like to add? I think that's good. Great. Okay. Looks like we have time for about one more. I'm going to uh, answer a specific specific question that was asked about when recruitment, what recruitment tactics can we use to target foster parents who would be willing to foster teenagers and larger sibling groups? Um, again, not to sound redundant, but adoptive kids in the NRC have 
um, published several publications around uh, recruitment strategies of older youth and sibling groups. Um, specifically, I would I would say um, to maybe promote an orientation that's specific to older youth, have older youth talk about their experiences. I think breaking down the myths of our youth is, is hugely um, important to humanize them. Um, and so I think that might be one strategy is to, to partner with your youth in your community um, to help with recruitment um, so families can meet, can meet youth um, that are in or have been in foster care. Um, but I would encourage you to go to our website. We have lots of resources around this, that topic. Um, I also would um, encourage you to think about how to develop families that are already in your system. Um, I think oftentimes once um, we don't necessarily think about developing families to care for that um, that population. So how can we get people to, how can we support and develop them to think about um, taking older youth? And that may be um, having older youth in, in training sessions, um, having them meet with families that are, are, are be mentored by families that are uh, fostering or have adopted um, older youth might be another strategy. So um, anything, uh, Maureen, you'd like to add to that one? I'm having a little bit of a storm here, so. <laughs> um, uh, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Great. Can I add one thing? Sure. Um, I, I would just add that one of the first things that I think we need to stop doing is stop using pictures of cute young children um, mm -hmm. in, our, in our recruitment materials. So to any extent that you are using photos as a part of your recruitment materials, your photos should reflect the population of kids that you're recruiting for. It should be sibling groups, multiple kids, um, kids of color, kids with disabilities, um, older kids. Um, I think we we shoot ourselves in the foot and set our families up for disappointment um, in the way we talk about uh, and the images that we use in bringing people in. Thank you, Angie. That's a great reminder. Um, we, we are about out of time. I would encourage you to stay on and answer our brief survey. Uh, I thank you all so much for attending. I um, uh, hope you all have a great afternoon, and please feel free to contact us um, at nrcdr at adoptjewishkids.org. Thank you so much for your time.